Hello. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Now, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great, mate. Great. You're really clear for me too. So you let me know when you're good to go. I'll connect you with Stephen. So just a reminder, this is for SBS The Guide. It's an online written piece, so the audio won't be used. Um, and if there's any technical problems, I'll get you both back on the line. We'll work out Zoom. Um, it, don't worry. Yeah, no, that's all good. Um, where will we find this online, this 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 piece? Okay, so it's like the TV guide, basically. That's right, yeah. So it's the editorial part, one of the editorial arms of SDS, and they do interviews with people on um, SDS programs, but also external as well. So they just kind of cover all things TV, film. Oh, um, yeah, cool. Awesome. Yeah, like reviews as well, previews of shows, that kind of thing. Yep, yep, I get you. It's like the old TV week. That's it, yeah. Exactly, the, just online. Online, yeah. Um, Nah, nah. Like, if nah. anything comes up that you don't want to talk about, just don't talk about it. Like, just you don't, don't feel pressured to have to answer anything. But Stephen's really good. He's super respectful and, yeah, he's really fantastic. Nah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, an, op- I'm an open book, mate. You would have seen that from watching what they <laughs> produced. <laughs> all right, all right, Neil. Just, just so you know, there's no pressure, all right? Yeah, um, nah, all I good. I will with Stephen, okay? All right, thanks okay. very much. Neil, I've still got you on the line. Yeah, mate. Beautiful, you're clear for me. Stephen, can you hear us both? Yeah, I can hear you both, babe. Hi, Neil. Oh, G'day, Stephen. How are you, mate? I'll just and leave you guys to it, all right? Thank you. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Clementine. Cheers. Hey, Neil, do you mind if I pop on a tape recorder? Nah, that's all right, mate. Do you mind if I record it as well? Yeah, of course. Go for it. Excellent. No worries, buddy. Go for it. How are you? Okay. So, I wonder, Neil, for you, when when did you, do you remember when you first became aware of the Tazi Tiger? You know, was it something when you were a kid or, or when, when, when did the kind of fascination first begin for you? It was in, well, I guess when I first realised about the animal was in 1976, actually. Um, I was in grade three in primary school. And I had a really horrible yep. teacher that used to beat the crap out of me with a stick. And um, oh, eventually, we I got moved into another class. And, and the other teacher that I went to, he was a really gentle man and he was really good. And we were allowed to grab a book from the shelf and read whatever we wanted. So I grabbed this book about animals and there was this striped dog looking thing in there. And it said, presumed extinct endangered species. And um, yeah. I was only like seven or eight years old and and a little spark was lit in my mind there and then about the what ifs i suppose um but it it, it didn't become a passion for a lot longer later (laughs) okay yeah 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 talk to me about when that spark i guess turned into a passion for you what was what was the moment where you where you became you know someone who was dedicated to to finding a surviving tiger um, well, it was after my second sighting in 2014. I, I had a sighting in 2010, um, yeah. and, and that sort of got me interested, and, and the, the, it didn't sort of really make me want to chase them around everywhere. But um, in 2014, in January, I actually saw one literally walk past my bedroom window one evening on a moonlit night. Um, and then a couple of days later, I found a heap of footprints that I was quite convinced were thylacine footprints. Um, not too far from oh, there. No. So that was when it really, and I, I went back to South Australia because I'm from Adelaide originally, and I got quite sick. I had pulmonary embolism, and I was bedridden for about three weeks. And okay. that gave me a bit of time to start Googling and searching, and that was when the the passion really kicked into gear. And she told me, you gave me a little descri- a nice description there of the 2014 sighting, but what was the 2010 one like? What, what happened then? Uh, I was walking the dog um, near a lake not far from my house in Tasmania, and she yep. took off chasing a wallaby, and I was yelling out, yelling out. She wouldn't come back, so I just kept walking towards the lake, and I could hear something walking in the bush, and it was breaking twigs and branches when it 
was, you know, treading on the ground. And then every time I stopped, it stopped. And it was stalking me. And it kind of gave me the creeps a bit. And I kept right. walking. And I was making lots of noise, yelling out for my dog. And this thing was still following yeah. me. And the hair yeah. on the back of my neck was kind of standing up a little bit. I um, right. came to a bit of a clearing up the hill and and sort of stood back a bit and looked around and it, it came out and it sat behind a clump of grass and it, it wasn't actually that big. It was a reasonably small animal. It was probably about as big as my, my dog um, and she yeah. was only a medium-sized dog and so I wasn't quite so scared but it sort of sat there behind a clump of grass and I could see its little rounded ears and I tried to get closer to it, and then as I tried to get closer to it, it thought that's close enough, and it took off. And that was when I saw it side on. Um, it was about half an hour before dark, so it was getting a bit dark. I didn't see stripes, but it was a, a dark chocolate sort of colour, um, and it had the long, yeah. stiff tail, and um, I knew what it was, but I was just a little bit thrown because of the colour, because um, I, I yeah. thought they were all a fawn colour with black stripes, but... You know, ten years later, I've learnt a lot, and um, they're not all like that. There's there's quite a variation in the colours and, and the way they present. Wow! So, but the 2014 one, and what is, is, did you say that with an older dog? Have you got a new dog now? What's the dog in the documentary called? I don't think her name gets mentioned. Oh, that's Jess. Um, yeah, my yes. my old dog yes. was a, a Kelpie Labrador Blue Heel across, and sadly she got cancer and had to be put down in 2020. Um, oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's life, mate. She was nearly 13. Uh, that was Maya. She's actually she got filmed when the when the crew from Walking Fish got to my house to do the initial um, uh, bit of filming. They do the pitch. Maya. For the for the for yeah. the funding, they actually turned up the day I was going to the vets with us. So there there was a whole lot of footage about my original dog that never made it into the uh, edit. But you know they might make another one and include her. But yeah, Jess is my new dog, and she's a real character. She, uh, as you would have seen, she likes to sing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she loves that in that dirty puddle as well. Yeah, she does. She's a bit of a bit of a scallywag. The back seat's her domain, so it's covered in mud and sand most of the time. Yeah. So when nineteen, I mean, sorry, twenty fourteen changed everything. Neil, when did when did what had sort of been a childhood fascination become something where you actually left work to focus on? You know, this huge hunt to, to prove the. They, they, they are, aren't actually extinct. Well, it sort of built up because in 2014, I was quite sick. I was still living in Adelaide. I got better. I went back to work. Everything was fine. But this, because I'd oh, seen oh, them twice, oh, Neil, sorry. I, I was sorry, a gardener. Neil, I was a, I was actually teaching yeah. horticulture at the time, um, but I ended yeah. up with a really good gardener's job at a very big estate public garden in Adelaide. Okay. That was a job I yep. threw in in the end in 2019. Um, I okay. resigned from that position and came back to Tassie. Um, but I suppose over that you know five year period between 2014 and 2019, I the more the more stones I turned over, the more information I I received, and the more obvious it became to me that these animals aren't actually extinct on the mainland either. They're they're all over mainland Australia. So um, right. that realisation for me was when the the passion really kicked in, I guess, because I thought, well, there's all these people with all these accounts and stories of what they've seen and they don't really get heard. So I wanted to make a forum where these people could respectfully um, say what they'd experienced without being ridiculed because the media historically has not necessarily been friendly towards people with these these stories um not yeah. not all of it but a lot of it was like oh you know they were just drunk coming home from the pub you know and and that's been the yeah. attitude of, of quite a few experts in the science field as well you know that because yeah. there's no dead animal to present for them to have the absolute proof they just fob everything off so i i guess i i started doing this not only for the animal but for the witnesses as well you know because I felt that they deserved a, a forum to say what they'd experienced and, and not be ridiculed for it. Yeah, absolutely. And so you create, 
one one of the things that really interests me, Neil, you created obviously this, um, you know, Tagola, and you've got something like ten thousand members. But then you also kind of talk about how, for you at least, it's a bit of a solitary pursuit. So you talk to me about, I guess, the balance between creating a community, but also for you it being a, a bit of a, a, you know, I guess a, a, a lone wolf, if you if you if you like. Well, the lone wolf thing is a little bit about my personality in some ways, I suppose. I'm a bit of an outspoken yeah. individual, um, and yeah. that doesn't necessarily always go down very well with certain audiences and certain forums. Um, and the scientific yeah. community is very methodical in its approach, and I'm a little bit of a rebel, I suppose, and I just sort of come crashing through that and said, well, you know, what about this? What about that? What about this? And they say we need a body, um, and that's fair enough. But we've got all this other anecdotal evidence that they don't want to consider. Um, okay. So, you know, me being, uh, I guess I've got a very public life online, but I'm a very private person when I'm not online. I like my privacy. Yeah. I love people. That makes sense. I, I used to yeah. sing in bands for like 24 years. I'm, I'm quite gregarious and outgoing. I'm not afraid of a crowd. I'm not afraid of public speaking. So that's that experience has sort of served me well with you know running a platform that I run um, and having the confidence in, in what I feel I know from my experience and what I've learned through this process to just say yeah. it how I see it. And if you like it, that's fine. If you don't like it, that's fine too. I don't really care, you know. Um, but, you know... Absolutely. After losing my daughter, I, I sort of reassessed yeah. my entire life in regards to what's important yeah. and what's not important. Yeah. And through that yeah. process, I sort of got to a point where standing there singing in a pub to a bunch of half inebriated people who loved what we did just wasn't really feeding my soul anymore. It was, you know, I, I'd achieved everything I ever really wanted to achieve with music. And I thought, well... Yeah. I was pretty passionate about doing music. I'm really passionate about this animal, so I'll just redirect that passion and see if we can't make a difference. Absolutely, and I love someone who pursues passion, but also as someone who's, you know, I've worked long and hard, Neil, to make a freelance career writing work, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, you know, if there weren't some tough times getting to a point where I'm actually, you know, um, supporting myself. How, how, for you, how is this the last few years, you know, giving up a good, well paid job to pursue this? Well, I'm sure it's quite expensive, all the, the gear and, you know, the time. So, yeah, how, how, how financially have you been okay? And, and is, how do you justify that, I guess, to yourself as well? Well, I'm very lucky to have paid off my mortgage, so I don't have a lot of yeah. daily debt. I'm a gardener, so yeah. I grow a lot of food. I don't eat a lot of meat anymore. Yeah. I, I do occasionally eat a bit of fish and a bit of chicken, but essentially I, I, I eat a lot of vegetables, so I live pretty cheap. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that well-paid job, I, I didn't leave there on real good terms. They they uh, they owed me some money, and they had to give it to me in the end, so that sort of, that sort of set me up for a few years where I didn't have to worry about earning money, so that gave me the freedom to pursue my passion and then yeah. we decided that we'd set up we tried to set up a charity but because the animal's extinct the Australian government didn't want us to have a charity because they say it's extinct so we'd kind of make yeah. them look a bit silly if they said we could have a charity and we were raising money to prove them wrong so cut right. a long story yeah. short we set up a incorporated association we got our website up and running we revamped everything um, and we got paid membership, and then I come up with the idea of um, trail camera sponsorship. So people could join, yeah. and they sponsor a trail camera. It costs $10 a month, and that includes you know me buying the camera and whatever little bit of extra money there is after the purchase of the camera, and I can tell you it's not much. Um, yeah. That just goes towards batteries, SD cards, and a bit of fuel in my petrol tank, basically. Yeah. And so in terms of, you know, we don't want to spoil too much about what what the documentary reveals, but maybe we can talk around the houses about moments that have given you faith that you're on the right path. Well, that's a good question, actually, um, or a good point. Um, 
I've I've had literally hundreds of you know probably getting close to saying thousands of people tell me their account of what they've experienced. Now yeah. th there's a lot of common denominators with what these people talk about very independently yeah. from each other. Ninety nine percent of them were never ever looking for a thylacine; they just encountered it. Um, yeah. And these are historical things that. You know, they, they, that are in the historical documentation about thylacines that match up. So to me, that's very strong evidence. Now, um, we find these rather large five toed footprints all over Australia. Uh, we find a bit of a variation in them. So that to me would indicate there's probably more than one species. Um, and yeah. these, these, and you know, since this, uh, documentary was released online, I've had daily reports of sightings coming in, like daily people are contacting me with with new sightings and old sightings. We've had four sightings this year so far in mainland Victoria, yeah. in rural Victoria, um, in yeah. mainland Australia. But, you know, if you talk to a scientist, these animals have been extinct for at least 2,000 years on the mainland. Well, explain to me these sightings then, you know? Um, yeah. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that gets ignored by science, um, and they seem to have an, an, an agenda to push for cloning something and totally ignore the bucket loads of evidence that's there to say that cloning it is a waste of time because it's not extinct. Let, let's talk about that, actually. I mean, obviously, I've seen Jurassic Park. That didn't end well. <laughs> 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 I love it. <laughs> how, how, do, how do you feel, Neil, that, I mean, is it, you know, how do you feel about the idea of the, the cloning? You know, is that something that could possibly live side by side with existing um, well, colonies? Or, yeah. A lot of people that get in the group mention cloning being a great way to bolster the gene pool. Well, this is all based on the assumption that they know the animal's extinct. So, or, or, you know, it might be there, but there's only fragments of it. So if we clone it, then we can help it. Well, if it's there, the only way we can really help it is to try and protect its habitat and its food source properly and not put it at yep. risk by throwing 1080 poison baits willy-nilly all over the place. Um, I think yeah. we, the practices that we use in land management are questionable in some cases. I mean, we still need timber, so we must have forestries. We need minerals. We must have mining. But we've got to find yeah. a balance where we can acknowledge the certain things that are there and work around them. Um, I've got a professor, prof Professor Weinstein from Adelaide University, who's been working with us for about two years now, and he's working on a paper... Okay that will enhance the differences between the the faithful searchers and the faithful scientists and find middle ground for those two very paradoxical kind of thought trains to come together on the one track and work together rather than, you know, it being science laughing at us and we scoffing at science because they don't want to listen to us sort of thing. It's about you know, making all of these things come together and putting it together and opening up the book rather than closing it. And, well, what if? What if, what are the, the things? Now, on the on, online museum, Natural Worlds, you've got three scientists contributing to that, and they're actually claiming on there um, that they believe the thylacine is an endangered species and not extinct because of the validity of so many sightings. Yet, officially... Yeah the government and the IUCN don't want to touch it. So, you know, I, I think I think Australia's grown up enough, especially Tasmania, to accept that the animal's still there, still have your industries, but just make those industries that little bit more responsible. And isn't there something to be said in, in these increasingly fraught times about different spheres listening to each other with respect and finding common ground? Exactly, exactly. And that's what I really love about Professor Weinstein's approach. He's actually looking at bridging that gap where science laughs at me and I tell them they're narrow-minded and actually coming to the table and saying, well, hang on, let's look at everything and come out with the best possible conservation um, outcomes for the environment rather than saying it's not there. Well, if we don't protect its habitat and it is there, then we, we risk losing it a second time, don't we? And isn't, it also, isn't there also a bigger picture here, Neil, in terms 
of, you know, I read these reports about how many species, you know, even even during like the 2019, 2020 Black Summer, we're told, you know, how many species were possibly eradicated during that time. Isn't it important in general that we pay more attention to the plight of endangered species and make sure, you know, whether it's endangered or extinct, make sure more animals aren't joining the, the tiger. Well, that's it. And and on top of that too, Stephen, you have all these Lazarus species that keep popping up. Um, so clearly yeah. the extinction model is flawed. The model they use to class something as extinct is chronically underfunded and flawed because they get proven wrong regularly. Right. Can you give me a couple of examples, Neil, of recent ones of, of, of Lazarus species? Absolutely. The night parrot in Australia was rediscovered. Yep. It was studied for about five or six years by a fellow before he came forward with his evidence to, to say, well, actually, yep. no, it's it's there and here's the proof. And still they scoffed wow. at him. But now they've discovered populations in Western Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland. It's there. Um, and they've only... That gives you hope. Beg your pardon? That gives you hope, Neil, that one day that you'll be able to have the, the tiger officially declared as a Lazarus species. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there there was Gilbert's Potteroo, there was the Pygmy Blue Tongue Lizard, there was um, uh, Leadbeater's Possum. You know, there's been quite a few animals in Australia that have been... Uh, just actually last week in the Pilbara in Western Australia, I think it was the Banded Hare Wallaby. Hasn't been seen on the mainland for over 30 years. It's, it's officially extinct on the mainland. Well, there it is, you know. Well, there you go. So, you know, it, obviously science is limited by funds, and if the funds are redirected at cloning rather than investigating existing species, I think that's a, a misappropriation of funds. And do you think as well the, 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 the kind of reports of chronic underfunding of science in Australia might also lead people to be more fixated on things that are easy to do or prove or, or back up? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I can give you an example. Now, the platypus in South Australia has been classed as extinct since the 1800s, right? Now, I've right. been running around South Australia for years talking about thylacines. No money, no money, no money, no money. A politician claims to have seen a platypus in the Sturt River. Suddenly, national parks jumped up and had money to investigate it. Right. What does that say? <laughs> Uh, you know, you are, hey. yeah, it's not what you are; it's who you are, and 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 where you might approve funding for something that they might need. Maybe I don't know, but it's sadly the dollar the dollar speaks, and um, you know, it it determines everything. But you know, I remember when Doctor Archer came out and said, "We got to clone, we got to clone it, we got to try and clone it and bring it back." The thylacine. Well, Doctor Archer wrote the paper for the thylacine's extinction. It's not a very well-known right. fact, but it is a fact. He wrote the paper for the extinction, and 15 years later, he was telling everyone we've got to clone it, you know? Um, and yeah. I just I just find something in that just doesn't sit right for me. It just doesn't. And, you know, when he was in charge of the Australian Museum, he actually did some displays about the thylacine where on the official display at the museum, it was stating that people who see thylacines on the mainland are drunk coming home from the pub. You know, and that's just totally disrespectful. Well, he's the leading authority in the science field on this subject, with especially when it comes to paleontology, and that's his attitude towards people that claim to have seen it. So that attitude needs to change on a scientific level because, you know, a lot of um, citizen science contributes to a lot of knowledge of what is out there. It really does. And, and, yeah, it's, and it's absolutely. time it was respected because a lot of people spend a lot of time and volunteer their time um, and and contribute to the known data of species regularly. And when they have the koala count, it's all volunteers. It's not paid. You know, there might be two or three paid people doing it. And then there's 10,000 volunteers running around looking for koalas, counting them. Um, and this yeah. needs this needs to be accepted for things that are claimed to be extinct as well. Just because someone yeah. said an animal's extinct, it doesn't mean that it is. Absolutely. Neil, one of the things that um, 
you know, you mentioned your daughter earlier, and obviously it's a really emotional part of the documentary. And, you know, your friend Ar- Ar- Andrew kind of talks about, you know, if it costs your marriage, will it cost your marriage? You obviously went through a really horrible time, you know, after, after the death of Julie. But then there's this beautiful moment where Sharna joins you on the search. Yeah. And talks about un- understanding why you needed to do this. So I'm trying to just, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to take you anywhere you don't feel comfortable, Neil, but if you do feel Mate, I can talk about anything about you want to talk about. I'm fine with it. So just ask me whatever you want to ask. Yeah, so what, what does it mean for you, for, for Sharna then, to kind of join you? And does that kind of, you know, I mean, does that help with some of the, the, the sadness of losing Julie too? Um, look, the... The thing with Shana was was a growth. We had to grow through that. When, when um, I, I can give you a bit of a background. Shana and I, Julia and I didn't see Shana for nearly six years, five and a half years. We didn't okay. actually see her. So Shana came along about ten months before Julia died. We had about ten months together before Julia had her accident and passed away. So the girls only okay. just got to know each other, and then they were torn apart. And that really was difficult for Shana because she was only like 10 years old when Julia died. She just turned 10. Um, and then okay. to make matters worse, I, I packed up and moved to Tasmania. I left Adelaide. So that really shattered Shana. Um, and I had to earn her respect. I went back to Adelaide in 2012. And in that seven years that I was back in Adelaide, not only did I earn her respect, but she grew to know me a lot better and understand me and, and not be so resentful of me. Um, and now she calls me her bestie and we get on fantastic. So, you know, that 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 trauma of losing Julia was quite possibly a very good thing for Shana and I to actually get to know each other and to learn how to, you know, comprehend how we work and love each other with respect and honesty. And, you know, she tells me absolutely everything and some of the things I don't want to know, <laughs> but she still tells me anyway because we, we have that level of respect and trust and love that um, is cemented, you know. It's absolutely cemented. There's there's nothing that can break break that bond anymore. We're, we're very close. And I'm very proud of the fact that I managed to earn her respect. She broke my balls for a long time she was hard work and i persevered and i persevered and i had to put my foot down i i, I had to give her some tough love because i wasn't putting up with her bullshit it got to a point a breaking point um and i just said look this is it this is the deal i don't i don't want to talk to you until you absolutely know that you want to spend time with me otherwise bugger off i've had enough you're all i've got and you're breaking my heart and it's already shattered so it's time to harden yeah. up and, and, and put on your big girl pants and grow up. And she did. And to her credit, I'm extremely proud of her. She's a very strong, capable, highly intelligent young woman. She's, she's survived. She's a very streetwise kid. She's a survivor and she's, you know, she just bought her own home. She's engaged. Um, she's working full time. She's doing great. She's, I'm really proud of her. You weren't lying when you said you just tell things straight, Neil. <laughs> nah, mate. Well, this it's the only way I, I roll, buddy. I'm some like I said. Sometimes people um, don't cope with that. Sometimes people really respect you for it. So it's it goes either way. Oh, absolutely. And just finally, Neil, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you for being so honest and open. Um, where where do you see? Is this is this a lifelong mission until you prove? Um, you know, you have that evidence or, you know, where, where, where do you go from here? I honestly don't know, mate. I mean, I'm very content. I'm happy. Um, I'm very appreciative of what I've got in life. I've, I've worked for it. I've earned it. I, I try and help other people as much as I can. Um, yeah. and like I've always said, I've always said it doesn't matter who proves it as long as somebody does. And I've sort of seen myself yeah. as a bit of a conduit to get the information out there, gather as much evidence as I can and share it far and wide right across the country and whoever pulls these pieces together and takes it to the next level of recognition, great, I've done my bit. I can go back to my garden and watch the potatoes grow and life's good. Brilliant. 
on it. Actually, Neil, do you mind me asking what age you are now? That'll I'm 53, you. mate. I'll be 54 this year. Great. I've got bugger all in my super. Um, I'm not broke, but I'm yeah. not far from it. I'm not too proud to go on the dole if I have to, but eh, till I have to, I'll just keep living off my savings. I think it becomes very personal. Um, for me, it is. It's it's about the experiences I've had, having that confidence and that faith in myself to know what I've seen, know what I've heard, know what I've found, and feeling that in your heart and, and just believing in yourself and believing in, in nature, in God, in love, believing in those things. And like when we got those photos last year and we got that little baby, which I'm telling you now is not a cat and it's nothing but a thylacine. I'll go on the record till I'm blue in the face. We called that baby hope. We called that baby hope because that's what that baby represents. It's hope for the future. It's hope for the species. And it's hope that mankind can get its shit together and actually look after the environment better. You're more than welcome. Are you in Scotland? No, I'm, like, I, I, I'm just confusing everything. I, I live in Melbourne. I've been here 17 years. Ah, good on you, mate. Good on you. How are you going with all the with all the crazy stuff over there? Starting to get a bit more normal now? It, it, it is. Um, my mum's not quite ready for me to get on a plane yet, though, so I'm looking forward to hopefully later in the year, after three years, seeing her again, hopefully. With, with Fantastic, mate. That's excellent. Yeah. Family is everything, buddy. They really are. I can't wait to get back, you know. Ah, oh, that'll be awesome. Hey, good luck, Neil. I really do hope you find it. Yeah, mate. I, look, like I said, someone's going to, and if they've found a bit of evidence that we've provided and that helps bring the pieces together, my job's done. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Neil. You have a great day, okay? You too, buddy. I look forward to seeing your piece. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye. Bye, Clementine. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Cheers, Stephen. Thanks very much, Clementine. Thanks so much, Neil. That was great. And, like, appreciate you being so honest. It's, it's so refreshing. And, you know, I just think people are really connect with your story. It's, it's fascinating. It's heartwarming. And um, we appreciate your time. We're really, really grateful. It's full of hope, honey, and that's what the world needs bucket loads yeah, of right now. It is. It is. Oh, thanks so much, Neil. Um, and as I said, I'll send you through the link when it goes up. All right? Excellent. Do that in an email for us. I will, I will. Awesome. All right, look forward to it. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye, Neil. You too. Bye-bye. How cool was that?